Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show, I have yet another kind of different one for you. I have Dr. Angus Harvey from Future Crunch. Future Crunch is a, is a company that looks at the changing world and technology's impact on it. And Dr. Harvey is a well-known speaker on the subject of technology and its impact on society and industry. And with that, here's my interview with Dr. Harvey. Hello, Angus. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks very much for having me on your podcast. Great to be here. Well, thank you for finding the time. You know, given that you're in Melbourne, it took some uh, coordination. <laughs> so 14 time zones. <laughs> so, <like that. laughs> Yeah, a little so, tricky. Uh, yeah, so Dr. Angus Harvey of Future Crunch. Tell us about Future Crunch. Future Crunch is an organization that explores what's happening on the frontiers of science and technology. And our job is to help people what's understanding out there so that they can be better prepared for what's coming down the line. We like to describe ourselves as field guides for the next economy. Fantastic. So let's talk about the, your history. So clearly you're a doctor and uh, <laughs> of some sort of field. I'm not sure yet, but we'll get to find out. Tell us uh, how you got to where you are, what led to Future Crunch. Sure. I, so my, my background is economics. I, I did my PhD at the London School of Economics. And economics was a fantastic subject to study uh, because it's the, it's the study of how you divide stuff up. It's the study of how you allocate scarce resources in a world where, where resources are limited. What was really interesting to me, though, after finishing my PhD, was that economics tends to not, very, to not account for technology very well. Because technology almost does the opposite of that. Technology makes resources abundant. And economics traditionally doesn't have a very good explanation for where that fits into the bigger scheme of things. So economics tends to be quite, a, quite obsessed with things like, for example, comparative advantage, where if people specialize in, in making a particular product, then it creates a sort of a larger, out, a better outcome for everyone involved. But strangely enough, um, that was always the focus in economics. Uh, the focus was never on the invention of new technologies, which makes resources more abundant on a much bigger scale than comparative advantage ever could. So I, I kind of got interested in technology towards the end of my PhD. And I also, by the end of my PhD, to be honest, was a bit disillusioned with the way that academia tended to approach the world. Because academia, the way I saw it, was very good at defining what the problems were. And if you go look at any popular book or any of the top intellectuals, you'll see that most of the books on the New York Times bestselling list or um, whoever our sort of leading intellectuals are, they're very good at defining what problems are, but they're, they're not great at defining solutions and figuring out how to move forward. So Future Crunch was kind of born out of a frustration with a world where it looked like I could see problems all around me, but no one was talking about solutions. So, we, so I, I teamed up with a scientist, a friend of mine who was a biotechnologist and a cancer researcher. His name is Tane Hunter. And he works here in Melbourne out of the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Care Centre, which is one of the leading cancer institutes in the world. And we teamed up to say, what would happen if you had a conversation between economics and science to talk about the solutions that are available out there, and in particular solutions that involve technology. And that started five years ago, and it's been a pretty pretty wild ride ever since, and we have discovered a lot of solutions. <laughs> it turns out that if you start looking for the solutions, um, they crop up everywhere all around you. There's that real confirmation bias that kicks in. So, so that's it's been a very gratifying journey. Yeah, and a bunch of projects that are, I mean, you, you, in your speech at, um, so just some background, I saw you speak at the Kalo conference in Ottawa, and the number of examples you gave towards massive, massive problems that society is facing from everything from global warming to you name it. The great part of it all, and it, it was funny, when it was a part of the, pres during the presentation when you went over like 12 crazy innovations, and I was sitting there smirking the entire time because I knew what the, what the tie that binded them all together was. And it was like the punchline was, and this happened in the last 30 days. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. There's so much good work being done out there. And the average person's context for it all is just barely existing because, you know, maybe someone makes the news, but usually it doesn't. So interesting. I, I too share a love for economics and a, and a frustration with the fact that the world does not fit into a two by two grid like yeah. economics likes to do on so many occasions. So I just let's before we go any further and, and talk about because I about you want to talk, uh, rehash some of the, the thoughts you've had in that previous presentation. Let's talk about how technology basically throws ma massive monkey wrenches in economics. Because while you while we were talking, so many things came to mind. Like, you know, you talked about scarcity of abundance, but I mean, you know, one of the big things that economics is so concerned with is, is inflation. 
right? Yeah. Meanwhile, technology is the greatest destroyer of inflation we've ever seen, and just through productivity gains. So, I mean, give me some examples of where you think economics falls down because technology is just throwing these monkey wrenches at it. So my, my favorite definition of technology, it, technology is a pretty broad term. I actually like to divide it into three constituent parts. Um, and I like to think about technology in, in three ways. Technology can be thought of as a tool. It can be thought of as a blueprint. And it can be thought of as a process. The best metaphor for that is that if you think about cooking or being in the kitchen, if you are going to be a successful chef, you need pretty good tools. So this is the technology of your pots and your pans and your knives and you're making sure you've got your microplaner and your sous vide or whatever your insane new tool is. And obviously- I do want a sous <laughs> There you go. And so even if you think about, if you think about cooking in the last few years, cooking has kind of almost gone, undergone a bit of a revolution because there's been a revolution in the tools that are available. There's been this kind of new movement of, of chefs and, and cooks who've said, what if we use modern technology to really kind of up our game in terms of what we can or can't do and what we can create in the kitchen? And so you can have really finely controlled cooking conditions. You know, your sous vide obviously gives you incredible control over what you can and can't do with meat and obviously all various different things and a, a better understand. And also the science is better and we understand how collagen breaks down and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's one way. So that's your tools. The other way you can think about technology is, is as a blueprint. And this is like the recipe. So this is obviously clearly a, a really important innovation when it comes to the kitchen. You can't be a good cook or a good chef unless you have a good list of instructions on how to put the things together. And there's no shortage of recipe books coming out every year of people who figured out new ways or new techniques of combining what we know are pretty standard ingredients in different ways to create new and exciting ways to cook in the kitchen. I think I read recently that the majority of bookshops these days tend to make, or certainly here in Australia, the majority of profits made by bookshops here in Australia are from cooking books. Really? Um, yeah, that's where, that's where they make all their money. <laughs> it's a country that's obsessed with cooking. Well, I mean, um, that kind of makes sense. That's one thing you're, you're going to want to have the physical copy of when you're working on the actual problems. So that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. But, yeah. but. So that's your blueprints. And there are endless blueprints and constant innovation all the time in different kinds of blueprints or recipes for the way you cook. But the most important, to my mind, aspect of technology is actually what we call process. Because as you're all too aware, it doesn't matter how good your tools are. It doesn't matter how many recipe books you have by the best chefs in the world. We all know that when you get into the kitchen, it's experience in terms of the actual process of how you cook that really matters. And that experience can only be learned by doing it many times over, by making lots of mistakes by understanding that when you put the butter on, you know, and the butter is just about melting, then maybe it's time to grab the green. The thing that often gets left right. out when people talk about technological innovation. Yep. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, I agree with you on all those points. They really are. And it's, um, I love when people say, oh, I hate technology and switch my response is great. Why don't you go back in your car and drive home and watch your television set in your air conditioned home and then wonder about how you're able to have that life without technology <laughs> because they're all different forms. There's just things we're used yeah. to and things we're not. So yeah, the absolutely. real core for bringing you on the show was to kind of rehash kind of your thesis behind that, that the presentation I saw. And I'm, I'm just going to let you run because you did such a good job of it. So tell us about kind of your, your thoughts on, on the nexus of a couple of major changes and how that's impacted everything. Sure. So bearing in mind that when we talk about technology, I'm, I'm usually either talking about blueprint tool or process. That's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind over here. Every time humanity progresses, it usually happens as a result of technological innovation in one of three areas. How we communicate, where we get our energy from, and how we use that energy to move around. And the third area, which is how we take care of ourselves. So the way to think about this in kind of almost biblical terms is language, fire, and medicine. And an example of that is in the first industrial revolution, we invented a new technology, the telegraph, and that allowed us to send messages across vast distances for the first time. And at around the same time, the British invented cheap printing presses, which made information accessible to the masses for the first time through cheap daily newspapers. Those cheap printing presses were powered by steam engines because the British had also figured out how to harness the power of coal. And coal completely transformed the way our society worked, it led to electrification, um, transformed our cities, 
And when we put those steam engines onto rails, it opened up entire continents to commerce and to trade. The next major upheaval came with the invention of the television, the, the radio, which led us into the age of mass media. And then we, at around the same time, we invented vast pool, we, we discovered vast pools of black dinosaur juice and, and oil, um, which made energy cheaper, more efficient, easier to transport, to move around. And oil obviously also became the fuel for um, cars, which became the engine rooms of the 20th century economy. They rearranged our cities. They transformed the face of the planet. And at both times, you also had revolutions in healthcare. So in the first industrial revolution, we discovered that disease was caused by tiny microbes called germs. You might remember that from school, you know, pasteurization, when Louis figured out that we can stop infection by making sure we kill off the germs. And the big medical innovation probably of the 20th century were, was the discovery of vaccines, which is this idea that we could inoculate ourselves against some of humanity's most deadly killers. And we've now vaccinated more than 6 billion people worldwide, worldwide, thanks to that, saving literally hundreds of millions of lives. I mean, some of the diseases we're vaccinating against have been some of the greatest scourges of humanity in history. So this idea roughly is that in each of these sections of innovation, communications, energy and transport, and healthcare, we get technological innovations in each of those that fundamentally rearranges the way that human society works. And the thesis that I spoke about in that presentation is that right now, in the sort of the first um, 20 to 30 years of the 21st century, we're undergoing another one of those massive upheavals that when we look back on it 50 to 100 years from now is going to seem just as transformational. Excellent. So let's talk about those three areas. And again, they're in the same three core areas. So looking at energy, telecommunication, and medicine. So pick your first one. Which one do you want to discuss first? <laughs> <laughs> What's um, your favorite? <laughs> I mean, where, 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 where to begin? Look, yeah. let's start with uh, communications. And the, the big one here is, it's not going to be news to anyone. People have heard this a thousand times over. Is It's the digital revolution. We are now on a planet where more than half of the world is connected and online. Um, there's 4 billion adults on, on the world with smartphones now. Almost 5 billion people over the age of 14 with a phone. So we've moved pretty rapidly, you know, in the space of 10 or 20 years to a world where almost every single person is connected to the greatest information resource our species has ever known. And that is an incredible change in a very short space of time. And I think we're only just starting to get our heads around that. A couple of those figures can be, a couple of those figures can be pretty mind-boggling. We have more than 2 billion people on the world's largest social media network. We've got 300 to 400 million people that identify regularly as gamers and more than 2 billion people that identify as gamers around the world. Four of the top 10 most valuable sports tournaments in the world are gaming tournaments, digital forms of entertainment. The world's top gaming tournaments are up there now with the US Open or the Super Bowl in terms of prize money. And again, that's an incredible change in a very short space of time. I feel like that's just getting started. I recently uh, went and did a full VR, a 3D immersion gaming system. So essentially, if you're not located to one place, which if I was, I'd be nauseous because the first time I tried VR, <laughs> it did not go so well. But basically, this empty warehouse where essentially we got to roam the entire area in 3D, but we had the headsets on and we were just in these virtual worlds. And I got to tell you, the first of all, you get so submerged in so quickly. And I thought immediately of the the ability to marry online gaming with with the actual, the real world and how much more compelling that entire store, that entire my story might be to watch and then taking that off was the most jarring thing that's happened to me in forever like just leaving oh, wow. that entire environment it was it was mm -hmm. quite profound and i think you know i've seen the stats on online gaming tournaments and all that and you're right it seems like our leisure goes there very early our education yeah. systems are going there the destruction of the massive when you think about the asymmetrical information problem that existed before the internet Literally, you you had this tiny domain of knowledge, and anything else was was massive amounts of research. And now the entire world's data bank is basically at in your phone. It's quite remarkable. For better or for worse, I mean, the problem is that because yeah. that's happened in such a short space of time, we've got both the the ill effects and the good effects of that. Now, the upside of of a of a sort of digital globalization like that is that. There are billions of people with access to the global economy who've never had access before. And also yep. billions of people who now have access to information resources they've never had access to before. So for example, one of my favorite apps is something called Hamdam, which is a Trojan horse app, which is a period tracking app in Iran. 
So in Iran, it's illegal for women to get information about legal rights, divorces, custody battles, etc. But what this app does is it acts as a Trojan horse that allows women to get that information in the guise of a period tracking app. So on the, on the no surface, man wants to look at it, Iran. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's a it's you know it's made by women for women. It's on the surface, it looks pretty innocuous, but underneath, it's got a wealth of information. That app has been downloaded more than 400,000 times by women in Iran. So we don't hear those stories very often when it comes to technology, because right now, especially in the English-speaking world, we're having a, a big hating on the big technology firms because there's been a big backlash against what's come before. Yeah, and in fairness, um, they, there was a mass betrayal of trust, quite honestly, in a lot of absolutely. this. But, uh, but, but yeah, so I mean, it's so the season of destruction that way. Yeah, and I think it's just important to remember that these are cyclical trends. You know, for for a decade or so, the tech companies could do no wrong. They were the darlings of everyone. And I think what you're seeing now is a very normal and natural backlash towards that. And what will happen is the pendulum will swing back again and we'll get something sort of that looks a little bit more like equilibrium. And I think that those big tech companies have got a lot to answer for, particularly around trust. And I think that's probably something that we can cover a little bit later, especially when it comes to fintech, because if the big tech companies so, are going to be moving into the fintech space... One of the big barriers they're going to have to overcome are those trust barriers. But keep in mind, those trust barriers only exist in places like in mostly English-speaking Anglo-Saxon countries. Yeah, where we for have the luxury the, of having trust barriers. Exactly. For the, for the 500 million or so unbanked or billion or so unbanked, they've never had a trusted intermediary in the first place. So it's a very different yeah. story depending on where you're standing. And I think that's the yeah, key yeah. message out of all of this is that the internet looks very different depending on where you stand in the world. And Absolutely. what we often talk about as the internet, we talk about it as though that's a North American or European or Australian thing. But for most people in the world, the, the internet doesn't feel and look like that at all. So, yeah, and we can come back to that. I mean, we're, we're having this conversation shortly after Facebook launched Libra, their, their, their blockchain invitation. We'll come back to that. So let's get on to the next one. Let's, uh, why don't we go to energy? So you talked about the revolutions in energy. Let's uh, talk about what's happening there. Energy is, is uh, an area that's particularly close to my heart as an environmental economist. That is probably my first love and, and probably always will be. And this is going to sound controversial, but as far as I can see, the elect electricity is being solved. We do not have to worry about electricity anymore. We are well past the point at which we're installing more clean energy than dirty energy globally. The price point has come down far enough in most places in the world that anyone who's looking to build new and any new energy resources right now has to think seriously about would have to have a very very good reason to be building dirty energy rather than clean energy and i think over the course of the next 10 or 20 years as those prices continue to drop especially around wind and solar and battery storage i think we're going to get to the point where the idea of generating electricity by setting black rocks on fire is going to seem as archaic as um, burning Wood stoves did. It's totally understand. I, I I agree with you, and I, it's totally. I mean, I mean you, one of the points you brought up at the conference was there's more people in the U.S. being employed by solar, the solar industry, than there is in. Is it was it oil or was it all fossil fuels? I can't remember. What not, that was. not not just more. I mean, substantially more. I think the U.S. solar industry employs. Uh, I think the U.S. clean energy industry now solar itself employs something like 250,000 people. I think coal supports 60,000 now in the United States. Yeah, and I mean, it's you can't. You can't be surprised that people who make kind of resistance against this kind of change and, you know, some political decisions get made because of that. But yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think we've hit, we're beyond the tipping point on that. We were in, we're in the downhills, like acceleration phase of all this. And, you know, thank God, because I want my son to actually have a planet that's going to still be around in several years. So yeah. that's, uh, that's the big concern. So, so let's move on then to the healthcare revolution and what you're seeing there. Well, just just another just another just sorry just okay, just another yeah, little, sure. little point there on, on energy. It's not all good news there, unfortunately, because unfortunately, um, electricity only counts for about one third of global carbon emissions. So even if we solve electricity and we get to zero carbon electricity production, let's say in the next twenty or thirty years, we still have two thirds of the global energy system to account for, and that two thirds of the global energy system is accounted for by transportation and by industry and by land use. Yeah. So we've got to solve transportation which also looks like it's probably on the way to being solved. It's happening. Uh, okay. We're seeing a huge electric vehicle um, revolution. But the one that's really difficult to solve, things like industry, heating, cooling, chemical processes, long-distance flights, long-distance trucking. And these are the kinds of areas of the economy that we haven't 
to be honest, we're not quite sure how we're going to be able to solve those on zero carbon. And I think globally, we're just starting to see a conversation now around how we do that. And I think those are going to be the real kickers. And I think where you're seeing demand for coal go up around the world, um, it's usually as a result of demand for coal going up in those areas, and particularly around industry. So there's still a big question mark. Yeah, I mean, while we're on that, while we're on that acceleration phase of of solar and clean energy, I, you're absolutely right on the rest of that. Then, but you know, we are again, and we are seeing those innovations. I mean, how many car companies have announced that they're not going to do any? They're basically go 100% renewable or 100% electric. Fingers crossed that the projects like Hyperloop actually end up working out and solving our long distance trucking problem to at least uh, some degree. And uh, you know, I've even heard about projects that are undertaking that are looking to do uh, electrical barges for for uh, shipping. But yeah. All improvement is good. If we ever get to zero, that'll be quite the interesting, uh, interesting culmination of a lot of technologies. But you know, progress. Well, it's going it, to it's it's going to it's going to be a very very interesting thirty years because the choice is pretty black and white. But we have to get to zero carbon. If we do not get to zero carbon by twenty fifty, we burn. Yeah. It, it's really it's really that simple. So the political and kind of economic upheaval that's going to have to take place to get to zero carbon in the next thirty years is is pretty much unprecedented. And I think that the scale of that change, I don't think most people have really considered how big it is because what we're talking about is the disruption of the most powerful industry in human history, the fossil fuels industry. We've never had a bigger, more powerful industry. And and in the next 30 years, that industry is going to disappear, whether we like it or not. Um, And fight tooth and nail all the way down. Yeah, and they're going to fight tooth and nail all the way down so it's going to be a very interesting time and i think that if you are an investor that battle is going to be incredibly ugly and i wouldn't be want to be caught on the right side of the wrong side of that yeah and as i said in canada a country that basically pats itself on the back for its rich abundant resources and natural resources you know that's something that's going to have devastating impacts on certain regions of this country and others but uh, you know the genie's out of the bottle on that we're heading that direction yeah, and I think, you know, politically, it's all very well to be arguing about these things now, but 20 years from now, when wildfires are ripping through different counties and, you know, you're really starting to see the effects of, of um, climate change really start to be felt, I think the political argument for things like fossil fuel subsidies or, or having any kind of support from fossil fuels industries become a lot, lot more difficult. And then you really don't want to be caught on the wrong side. No, no, I agree. All right, so I think, so let's move on to the biotechnology side. So let's talk about the innovations there, because I think this so has the, probably, I mean, don't get me wrong, well, energy has an enormous impact on the financial, what we've talked about already is, has an enormous impact. This is going to be one that's going to be, assuming we don't blow ourselves up in the meantime, have the most impact. <laughs> the healthcare sector is in a, a really interesting place at the moment, because what we're seeing is a revolution in diagnostics and in treatment. And that revolution kind of first really, that revolution kind of really got started with the sequencing of the first human genome at the beginning of this century. That first human genome took us about 20, it took us a decade to complete. Uh, it took us 13 years actually to complete and it cost four and a half billion dollars. Today, which is 16 years later, it takes less than 24 hours to sequence a human genome and it costs less than a thousand dollars. And the reason this was such a big deal, it, or the reason it is such a big deal is because we now are able to look with precision at what causes disease, what medicines are likely to affect you in particular ways, what exercise is likely to affect you in particular ways, what proclivities you have to certain kinds of diseases, what your risk profiles are. Um, And really, if you want to kind of liken this to kind of the financial services industry, it's kind of like you finally got to have a look at someone's box. Well, I suppose most of human history, what we've been looking at here is just what's on the surface of of a particular entity or, or a company, what we've finally been able to do now with the sequencing of the human genome is we're actually now able to go into their books and see what's actually going on there, not just what's on the surface. So we're not just seeing the symptoms, we're not just seeing the way they behave in the marketplace, and we're not just seeing what their quarterly statement is, or we're not just seeing what their website looks like. What we're actually now able to do is go in with precision into their books and find out exactly what's going in, um, what their incomings and outgoings are. And once we know that... Simple, uh... Sorry, and a very simple limitation of that. I mean, my 23 and me constantly updates with new things they're discovering and telling me about. And I'm not saying that they're the best source for this sort of information, but this is happening in real time in many cases right now for people. Yeah. And I think the so something like 23 and me, which is a service that provides you with personalized information about your particular genome, 23 and me doesn't sequence your entire genome. 23 and me only sequences a small section of your genome. That's not necessarily the most accurate, but it's not a very accurate way to do it at all. Um, mm-hmm. And the other problem is because the science is a, 
evolving so quickly in this area, it's still very early days. You know, we're still getting the handle on what particular genes mean, um, how particular genes cause particular kinds of disease. And the other issue is that just as we discovered genetics, we discovered something called epigenetics, which is that it turns out that the environment around your genes can switch certain genes on and off. So to come back to that metaphor again, we used to think that DNA was the blueprint for a human being. It was the recipe for how to make a human being from the bottom up. It turns out that DNA is kind of like the, is kind of like the ingredients list. So it's what's in your DNA that allows you to make a human being. But epigenetics is the set of instructions that turns different, that turns different genes on and off. So epigenetics is the actual instructions. It's the actual instructions list that says, right, turn this gene on over here. If this person is in an environment that, where, for example, they're getting lots of exercise, they're eating healthy food. If you do that, then that particular gene reacts to your environment in a particular way. If you're eating bad food or you have particular stress levels, then that might affect your gene expression. So the science is getting more and more complex. Um, it's becoming more precise, but we're sort of still getting a handle on it. But the insights we're getting are incredible already. What else are we seeing in that field? So the big medical innovation of the last decade was the ability to read the human gene. And the big medical innovation of this decade is the ability to actually cut and paste the human gene to cut and paste uh, yes, DNA. CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9. And that has been talked about a lot. Um, we're obviously seeing an array of pretty dazzling innovations uh, when it comes to CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR-Cas9, a lot of people are freaked out about it. They sort of think that we're going to end up with designer babies and we're going to end up in this sort of um, the haves and the have-nots and uh, mm. the rich are going to edit their babies and the poor are going to be left behind. That is science fiction. That is not what's going to happen. Uh, CRISPR-Cas9. That was called uh, Gattaca. Sorry. That was called Gattaca. Exactly. <laughs> which, was, which was a great movie. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> it was a great movie. Hollywood likes to... We like to tell ourselves dystopian stories when it comes to technology. That is yeah. human nature. We like stories that are thrive on conflict and fear. I think that CRISPR-Cas9... The problem is that genes around things like physical prowess or intelligence are incredibly complex. It's hundreds of genes. We don't actually know what codes for intelligence or what codes for, even what codes for good looks or um, the ability to sprint 100 meters faster than somebody else. The problem with CRISPR is that as soon as you start editing, if you edit one gene, that's one thing. But if you edit two, then three, then four, the, the problem of what you call off-target effects becomes exponentially higher. So the problem for mistakes or the problem for um, issues that arise increases exponentially the more genes that you start to slip out or change. Well, you have the nth degree problem, right? It's two to the power. I mean, if there's any two, only two settings, in which case there's not, there's usually more than one, two options for a gene. You know, that's the power of the number of genes you're touching. It's just that number gets very big very quickly and the number of outcomes just becomes almost beyond human comprehension to actually master. Exactly. And so if you're talking about saying we're going to modify hundreds of genes simultaneously to try code for intelligence, it's just not going to happen. Or well, it's certainly not going to happen within our lifetimes. What CRISPR-Cas9 can do right now is it can, elim- it can snip out or eliminate one gene. And the thing is that there are thousands of genetic defects and debilitating diseases that are caused by a single genetic defect. So the question that I would have maybe for your listeners is that it's all very well to be scared by this, but if you had the option where your unborn child had been diagnosed with one of those maybe 10,000 diseases that are caused by a single genetic defect, and the doctor said to you, you can simply and easily do something about this right now, what would you do? I know what I would I mean, do. As a father of two who did the genetic testing in advance of the child being born, because that's pretty common, at least in my country, and asked the question of how would you react to that, I don't know. But I can tell you that if the option to fix that was on the table, it would not matter. That signature would be on the paper the second they finished asking the question. Exactly. So I think, yeah. I think where genetic editing and things like CRISPR-Cas9 are going to be, they're going to be more like a, um, like a vaccine. There's something to eradicate disease before it begins rather than something that we use to create superhumans or end up in a sort of dystopian world. Yeah, I agree. So all of this points to a couple of things, you know, assuming we don't blow ourselves up by 2050, you know, the impact, <laughs> I'm going to bring this, as much as I love talking about technological themes in general, the show is called FinTech Impact. So let's talk about the impact on technology and finance. So, I mean, we can go through all three of these and the 
you know, we talked about the, the technology and technology innovation we've seen from the internet alone thus far. I mean, there was a time not that long ago when to even get a stock quote, you had to call your broker and basically ask for the verbal stock quote because they were basically paying a fortune to get this in real time for 20 minute delays. And then if you wanted to place a trade, it was over $100 for the privilege. And now literally there are apps where you can trade for free and get real time quotes. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that just utterly turn the value proposition of the investment industry upside down, and rightly so, to things that hopefully are more beneficial. Where we haven't seen it happen as much yet, other than insurance premiums getting cheaper on life insurance, is, is on the longevity side, which, I mean, everything you're talking about here in terms of these you know, genetic modification, genetic testing, understanding the genome, I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing all kinds of new medications being developed specifically to target genetic issues, and they can, they can actually target treatments specific to your genome, which is insane, and <laughs> when you think about it, the prospects for human longevity just continue to increase. That, on a financial side, I mean, like from my standpoint, I sit back and say, okay, the accumulation risk on investment portfolios is already called the hardest problem in finance. Throw 20 years of longevity onto that and see how much harder it gets. Like, where's the technological solution for helping me with that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's important when you're asking these kind of questions to really kind of boil it back down to, to base principles. The reason the technology companies are so successful is because they manage, analyze, and use the insights that they derive from data analysis better than anybody else on the planet. These are companies that put data first and foremost in everything that they do. And the reason they do that is because they have access to vast pools of data. And because their pools of data are so much bigger than anybody else's, that gives them the kinds of insights and predictive capabilities that other organizations don't have. So one reason this is to do with network effects is, is once you, in a digital economy, once once you're slightly ahead of somebody else, you kind of tend to race away from them. Network effects mean that you grow bigger, quicker than anybody else. And once, um, once you've kind of tipped over into one organization being slightly ahead of another, organization, another company, then they tend to kind of race away with the prize. This is the interesting thing about technology and digital technologies. They tend to have um, power law effects. So what tends to happen, you've seen this in media, you've seen this in communications, you're probably about to see it happen in fintech now as well is that digital technologies, what they tend to do is they tend to create three or four or five giants. Um, so a small pool of really big companies and then a really long tail of small little companies and everything in the middle kind of gets cut out. So you don't really have medium sized companies anymore. You have they mass market can... on one side that appeals to the most people in the most broad way possible. Then you have niche players on the other side that highly specialize in one area and, and can basically command larger margins per consumer than you could. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've already, we're seeing that happen in just the financial advisor space altogether, right? The U.S. is probably far more accelerated than this than other places. But Michael Kitsis, a well-known commentator in the space, talks about the, I think it's called it the unforgiving middle. And you have like, you know, you're going to have the large transaction-oriented, quick, fast, cheap experiences on one end. And you're going to have that very niche player on the other side. And I, when I speak to advisors, advisor conferences on this, I basically say like, look, here's simple here's two logos. One is McDonald's. We know what they do. Cheap, fast, mass market, billions and billions served. Here's a logo for the top rated restaurant in this country. Have you ever seen it before? No. Who do you think commands more volume? Who do you think makes more money per location? That guy. But yeah. on the grand scheme of things, that guy, right? So yeah. agreed. You get the polarization and it's, it's only going to accelerate beyond that. Although what I do think that's interesting is that I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like all this innovation is leading to the ability for that tail to get even longer. The ability to, to develop profitable niche experiences that podcasting is almost an example of that in that the, the cost of implementation is so small that you can have these hyper-specific niche podcasts like mine that essentially can find an audience. Whereas before this was radio, I would never be on the air. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and I think that if you're a financial advisory firm, once you start thinking about it like that, then you don't need to have access to the largest pools of data out of any of the firms. You're not trying to play on the same playing field as the big mega, as the tech giants. The job of a smaller financial advisory firm or a boutique firm is to say, with what data we do have, we're using, we're prioritizing data analysis. We've actually hired a data scientist, for example. How many small financial advisory firms do you know actually have a data scientist employed? Very, very, very few. In fact, when I work in collab, my dealership actually only handled the data integrity officer recently. So data science, they so, also have someone there as well, but it's not, it's, it's still early days, very early days. So in a world, so according to McKinsey, since 2015, data flows have accounted for more global GDP growth than the world's entire physical goods trade. 
since 2015. So we've already crossed over to the point where we're in a data-led economy. So, the new oil. so how can a financial advisory firm in 2019 legitimately be saying we're ready for the 21st century if they don't have a data scientist employed, someone who is able to say, we've got a ton of data coming in from multiple different sources. A lot of it's publicly available. You talked about it just now about stock tracking, financial yeah. picks. You know, there is such a wealth of data available. Can we hire a data scientist, someone who's able to say, we're going to collate and curate the data that's relevant for us in terms of our boutique area of speciality. We're going to clean that data. We're going to get that data ready into a point where we can actually use it. And then we're going to be able to derive proper insights from that data to be able to serve our clients more, to be able to give our clients a better service. So you've got a data scientist, maybe you've got a data analytics person, and then you've got someone that can put that information together and to, to create excellent insights. So that's two or three people. That should be the priority for any smaller financial advisory firm in 2019, because that is the new world that we're all sitting and living in. And I think if you can prioritize that emphasis on having clean, usable data that gives you insights, then that's the most important thing that any financial advisory firm can do right now. Well, you hit the nail on the head on the type of data, the issue. Uh, the issue is, is that clean, usable data is something that they have never really cared about before. So the companies I know of that are un undergoing these just astonishingly expensive data cleansing projects, because they basically, to them, it was, we kind of need to have this to report stuff for decades. And now they're basically saying, wow, the format we kept it in is borderline useless for this new paradigm. Yeah. And they're spending beyond crazy amounts of money just to get it in a usable format. Is insane and absolutely and this is where i think some of the newer players you know the robots will not have an advantage that when you're starting from zero you don't have that much data but everything you're collecting is clean <laughs> yeah, right. and you're able to make action off of a lot faster and it's going to take the yeah. incumbents uh, some time to pivot and understand that and appreciate it and i will say this much a lot of them are, are spending some real big money to get there they don't want to be left yeah. behind yeah, yeah absolutely good i think having just a bit of advice around that saying look here's what we think is going to be relevant here's what's not going to be relevant here's the format that we need to store it in and here are some of the things that we could do with this further down the line. That, that, that's pretty basic, but it's fundamental at this point of the game. It's challenging though. You have people at the top of these companies just don't understand how this is, it came up in an age where this doesn't, wasn't a thing. You're telling them now about like, oh, we can collect all this and throw machine learning at it and find all these correlations you never thought of before and figure out how to service every you know, group of 10 customers down to specific, you know, hyper-specific service things. And they're just like, how much is this gonna cost? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're not rewarded for taking technological risk. I often say, you know, it's, it's like the same thing that anyone competes with Amazon. It's really unfair to compete with Amazon when you're in bricks and mortar because you've got to show, if you're a publicly traded company, you've got to show profit. No one expects Amazon yeah. to show profit. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, uh, if, you're, if you're a bank, same problem. So you've been very kind with your time and you're coming up to uh, close to an hour. So I'm going to finish up with the three big questions, I, or three thinking questions I asked everybody at the end of it. And we didn't spend as much time on fintech, but that's okay because I think everything you said was more, I care more about the rest of the world than just technology than finance. <laughs> so first question is, um, if you had one wish for something you could change in your career, job, work, world, whatever it is, what would that be? Wow, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> it stumps everybody. <laughs> um, let, let, let's come let's come back round to that one no problem uh, uh, let, let's try the other two first I, I'm, I'm going to let that one sit in the subconscious while I answer sure. the other two so the second question is what's the biggest challenge you've encountered in getting your career and company to date uh, to where it is I think um, probably the biggest challenge for us has been trying I think probably getting attention in a pretty crowded marketplace there are a lot of people talking about science, technology, innovation, you know, speaking about a lot of these topics um, in the world at the moment. And the best piece of advice I ever got um, around that was uh, from a podcast that I listened to. It was probably about five years ago. I think I was actually listening to the Tim Ferriss show. And I don't remember who has been interviewed, but they say that they said that it's not what you know, it's what you do regularly that counts. And for me, yeah. that was like, a, that, was, that was a real light bulb moment, which was that it doesn't matter how smart I was or it didn't matter what my insights were. If I wasn't pitching up week after week, doing something really consistently, then people would never know that I was doing it. And I think for me, that was a really big motivation to say, you know, this is about a daily practice or about a weekly practice of getting, of becoming, you know, of doing thought leadership, of writing and thinking, of, get, of getting your work out there. And I think for me, that's been the most powerful that's been the most powerful technique, I think, that, that I could possibly impart on anybody else. It's not what you know, it's what you do regularly that counts. 100%. It's, um, 
Oh, who was the, I remember there was uh, Jason Calacanis' podcast on uh, This Week in Startups. Someone in his listener email, he had this one person ask him a question of like, oh, I've come up with this incredible idea for a business, but I don't, you know, I don't think I can build it from, oh, this, for pride. I don't think I can build the business to do this. You know, how do I defend this idea and then take it to others and, you know, and monetize off it? To which he said, like, here's a better idea. If you're not willing to do it, don't do it. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> it's, you know, he who moves first, it's going to win. And it's those who basically take those risks that are going to actually it's, it's, it's the action that gets you there, not the idea, right? Yeah. We can all sit back and think in our own heads all day. So the third question, you can come back to the first in a minute, is what excites you about what you're doing? What, what gets you up in the morning and keeps you going? What's really exciting to me is that if we, we're at this really interesting kind of pivotal point, I think, uh, in terms of what's going to happen to the global economy in the next 10 or 20 years. It could go one of two ways. It could all spin off the rails and, and we could end up screwing up the energy system and we end up in some dystopian world with police walking around with facial recognition goggles everywhere and the tech companies hoarding all our data and everyone living in, in um, 1984. Or it, we could end up in this world where we have better rules around data and privacy, where we've got better insights, better healthcare, We've fixed our global energy system. We've uh, been able to get new digital products. We've created a world that's more abundant. Um, we've been able to get more stuff for everyone. And I think, to me, it looks like we're probably more likely to get to that second state of the world than the first state of the world, based on, on what it looks like at the moment. And it could be messy and it could be ugly to get there, but we have a very good opportunity here of getting to a world that's cleaner, safer, fairer, more sustainable and more abundant for, for everyone on the planet. And, and I think that's an incredibly exciting prospect and something that I'd be very, you know, that, that I'm very excited about working towards and telling the stories of um, over the next 10 or 20 years. Well, I don't, play, I don't blame you. I mean, you know, getting to do what you do all day, sitting back and looking for the answers. And this stuff is, I mean, some of this stuff is just so exciting to just, you know, see some of the creative ways people are tackling, tackling like literally world threatening problems in basic fundamental ways with just such creativity. It's, it's got to be inspiring to do that every day. Yeah, and also so, for the first for the first time, the whole world's taking part in this conversation now. That's never happened before. We are all doing this as one, and I think that is very new and incredibly uplifting and, and affirming. We're doing this now as four or five billion people, rather than uh, just a few decision makers at the top of the pile. Yeah, it's funny. I, when you talk about climate change, one of the mind, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, Bill Nye, the poor man, constantly being called up on television to defend the fact that climate change is real. Poor guy. <laughs> one, one of these days, I hope he, I hope he lives long enough to find time to do something else. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> poor, poor, poor Bill Nye. He keeps on saying, like, you know, we solved, we got to the moon in such a short period of time because we determined, we were determined to do it as a society, right? And you think about, you know, your comment about we can fix the planet, the technology is there. But we can do it, not only are we going to do it on a, on a local basis of a country, we have the opportunity to do it on a global basis with all the players, because everybody's got a vested interest in that. So it's a remarkable yeah. time. So uh, have you thought about a wish yet? <laughs> <laughs> so what's, the thing that I, what's, what's one thing that I, that I would have changed? I think probably in hindsight, I would have loved to have built a company that wasn't as location-based. I think that's actually something that I'm starting to do now. I think I didn't quite realize the ability of a global digital revolution to free us up from geographic locations and for the ability to kind of be able to work from anywhere. And I think that if I thought about that earlier on in my career, I might have been closer to the point now where I didn't, for example, have to be in one place all year round. And I think that's something that I'm starting to think a lot about now um, in terms of the work that we do and, and how we do it at Future Crunch. We are a, a, an organization that talks about global stories. We speak to global audiences. And I think over the next three or four years, I'm really keen to start thinking about how it's possible, for example, to work two or three months in another country, um, to be actually able to visit some of these places um, that we talk about. Um, I think there's no substitute I, for I, I can, experience. Uh, if you want, I can connect you with a couple of company founders who uh, like the joke. So they, I interviewed a accounting firm on, on this uh, podcast before because I've worked with them because they're basically, they have no physical office. Everybody works remotely. Some of them are basically global vagabonds. And the two founders like the joint joke that they're the only two large accounting company founders that literally are homeless. One of them is driving <laughs> around in a, in a uh, motorhome all the time with his family across North America. And the other one, every time I talk to him, it's like, where are you today? Oh, Brazil. Where are you today? Argentina. Where are you today? Israel. Where are you today? It's just, it's, so yeah, they are very used to the entire pickup and move and, and still 
very effectively. I mean, their, their company is over 50 people now. So I'm somewhat envious at the idea of being <laughs> able to do that. That's for sure. So um, mm -hmm. Angus, thank you so much for this time. It's been greatly enlightening. I hope everybody enjoyed as much as I did. Um, I thought, you know, a lot of bells went off for me in terms of the, your presentation of like, you know what, those three things working together. And I started thinking throughout history, you're absolutely right. That is, that is rocket fuel for, for innovation. Yeah. Thanks Jason. And um, if, if your listeners are interested in, in following our stuff and keeping up with us, we, we have a newsletter. They just got to have to Google future. Future Crunch, um, and yep. on the Future Crunch page, they'll see there's a, there's a tab there that says subscribe, and, and we uh, use that newsletter to tell stories of solutions, technological innovation. It's a pretty good way to keep up with uh, some of the big changes that are happening in the world, and it's free. So, um, yeah. yeah. And it's lengthy. It's pretty thorough. I got to tell you, when I signed up for it, I was like, wow, this comes out how often? <laughs> so uh, it took me a while <laughs> to get through it, but it was worth it. Yes. And I'll we'll make sure they're in we'll be sure to include that in the show notes so people can find it there. But, yeah, yeah. Angus, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Jason. It's been great to be on, on the podcast. So that was my interview with Angus Harvey. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. The presentation, uh, I believe he's got several of them online for you. I would highly encourage you to do that because he tells quite the compelling story online and in person. And with that, as always, I'm Jason Pereira, and this is Fintech Impact. If you enjoy this podcast, please review an iTunes, Stitcher, or visit your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.ca.